and welcome to Casually Criterion, a casual cinemedia podcast. My name is Chris. My name's Mike. And my name's Justin. Casually Criterion is where we watch and discuss the Criterion Collection in spine order. Today's episode, we're going over Pierre Paolo Pasolini's Sallow, or the 120 Days of Sodom. We are. We're doing it. Yeah, this is the one, you know, since we started it, I've been dreading. Uh, now I've actually seen it, and I get to talk about it with you guys, so this is the big Ooh, one. This was, your, this was your first time seeing it? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. Exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing what you think. Me too. And if you want to follow along with what we're watching next, you want to let us know what you think about Solo, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinemedia. You can join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash Casual Cinemedia, where you can talk film, talk film news, uh, whatever you want to do. You can also email us directly at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. All right, we have our iTunes review contest going on. Go ahead and rate us five stars. Give us a little feedback, constructive feedback. And then send in the picture of it, and we will pick somebody at random at the end of the month. They get to pick a movie for us to review on a bonus episode. So that sounds fun, and there's not much time left in the month, so go ahead and do that now. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah, I like doing the user-requested movies. That's, that's fun. We get some things we haven't heard of. Or maybe otherwise wouldn't watch. Yeah, surprise yeah, and we movies. get to interact with you guys a little bit more, which also makes the show probably more fun for everybody. And last thing, before we move into what's on our mind, we wanted to remind you guys that uh, we are currently promoting this nonprofit charity organization of our friends called Real Outreach. That's R-E-E-L Outreach. They have a website, realoutreach.com. What they are doing is they are giving less fortunate families and kids the opportunity to go see a movie in the theaters. Uh, they're organizing events where... They're inviting kids from like foster homes, boys and girls clubs. They're also getting ticket vouchers and concession vouchers for kids to go like out on their own outside of these events. And I think it's a really great cause. Yeah, absolutely. I think every little kid should get to go see like a really fun movie in theaters. That's some of my favorite memories are of me just going to get to see movies as a little kid and just being completely transported to somewhere else, you know? Yeah. Those are like some of the only things I can remember about being a kid. Like I have these memories of being at either like the movie theater or the drive-in. You know, those, right. those are really and, prominent for me. Yeah, and movie theaters won't be around forever. So, you know, support this cause. Get a whole generation of kids who might otherwise not get a chance to have those memories. Uh, give them a chance to do that. Yeah, the event of going to a movie theater is a really thrilling event for a child. And, uh, yeah, don't rob them of it. Yeah, and if you want to help out, you can – Go to their website, which again is realoutreach.com. There you can give a one-time donation. You can give a monthly recurring donation. They also have a GoFundMe setup, which is linked on the website for their first big event is for Avengers Infinity War and getting kids to go see that. You can give to that GoFundMe and directly send a kid to like to see specifically Avengers Infinity War as opposed to just a general donation. But it all helps. Every little bit. So right now, let's go ahead and transition into what's on our minds. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. I never go first. Is it fun? Throw the whole game off. Yeah. yeah. Am I going to screw everyone up? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, go. I'm already confused. <laughs> <laughs> I started confused. Okay. Well, first up for me is that in preparing for Solo, uh, my girlfriend and I, who she basically has never wanted to watch Solo. She's known about it since we started dating and was like, this is the one movie we'll never watch. And so to prepare for that, we watched some other movies that she at one point in her life vowed to never watch. Which were the Hostel movies, uh, Hostel One and Two. We did not venture into Three because I think that was a like a straight to DVD sort of. There's uh, a Hostel uh, Three. Yeah, there's, and I think it's straight to DVD. Like it didn't actually get a theatrical release or a big one like Hostel One and Hostel Two did. So those were the only mm-hmm. ones we watched. Uh, they're they're both directed by Eli Roth, which is another reason we stuck to those because he did not have anything to do with the third one. I think, other than maybe like just having his name attached because he owns like the like a producer or yeah something. owns like the copyright to like the idea of hostile uh, have, I, have, have either of you guys seen these movies or have you seen them in a while recently i don't think i've seen either one of them since uh, i saw them in theaters but i have seen them i have never seen them uh, for reasons that we will get to probably later in, on in solo but <laughs> yeah i haven't seen them yeah they're, they're these movies that basically came out around the same time that saw was really big and there was sort of this like i think what people call like a torture porn horror movies where it was just people getting tortured and like mutilated in like very brutal ways there's a lot of sitting in chairs and screaming while you're being tortured in these films or at least there is there's a lot of that in saw and and i wanted to talk about the hostile movies because i was actually surprised going back to visit them and how little 
torture and gore there is in the movies. Like maybe if you added it up from both movies, you might have like five to six minutes of torture. Maybe, maybe a little bit more. I'm kind of guesstimating there. Does that surprise you guys? Cause I, I remember the movies being really graphic and like having a lot of it. I remember the first one pretty well. It would surprise me about the first one, I would say. I, and from what I remember of the second one, I remember, I didn't, well, first of all, I didn't like it very much, but I remember the tone for the second one was a lot more humorous and a lot less serious and like suspenseful than the first one. I don't even remember any scenes from the second one except the very end of the movie. The last scene of the movie is literally the only thing in the first scene of the movie where spoilers for Hostel Part 2, the main character of the first one gets killed within like the first two minutes of Hostel Part 2. He does. Which irritated the shit out of me when I first saw it. Yeah, I guess that would surprise me if it's only five to ten minutes of torture. It's a lot of build-up to the torture, though. Yeah. It is. And and you're right. Like, the second one is way more campy. And it's, honestly, looking at it now, it's way more fun. And, and watching them back-to-back. Because back, when I saw them originally, I saw them each in theater. So there was a couple years between films. Mm-hmm. And the first one, in my opinion, isn't very good. Like, it's kind of cliche. And, and like you said, it's very serious in tone. And the second one seems like they're just having a lot of fun and particularly with the way that it ends, which we've mm-hmm. already said spoiler alert, but spoiler alert again for the way the hostel two ends the, one of the main bad guys, they chop off their head and give it to a group of like hoodlum kids that are running around throughout the movie. And they start playing soccer. They run off and start playing soccer with like the head, which is really, really silly and fun. And that's like the last image of the movie. And um, yeah. doesn't one of them like score a goal with like the head? Yeah, he scores a goal and he like puts his shirt up over his head and starts running around celebrating. And it's very very silly. And honestly, I really like the second one. I think like I don't I'm I don't love it. I'm not going to go out and buy it, but like it's really fun to watch. Well, I can imagine after Hostel Part One, watching Hostel Part Two with like a slightly sillier outlook and attitude would probably make for a more enjoyable experience. I got to ask, though, <laughs> do you like these movies more now than you did then when you first watched them when you were younger, or do they not age very well? I think the first one doesn't age that well because it's so serious and it all needs to like sure work in order for the movie to work. You know what I mean? Like You have to buy into yeah. it all and be invested, and, and I don't think that that – part of it quite holds up because there are like really simplified characters in it. Like they're motivated by boobs essentially. <laughs> right. It's as far right. as like their characters go and get, then how they get into the situation. And I, I think now we might want something a little more nuanced than that. I think uh, the second one has all of the, the camp and the fun and like kind of like ridiculous torture type and like deaths that happen in it that are like, they're not even like, in line with like saw they're just like borderline silly i think that makes it more enjoyable now like i I definitely like the second one more than i did when i saw it in theaters without getting too far into it solo and hostile i think are somewhat related does hostile have meaning to it like solo i think when they made solo they were trying to put meaning behind the the violence and does hostile have a meaning or is it torture porn where that's basically the only reason for the movie Does that make sense? I think the first one is closer to torture porn, even though there's not very much in it. I think they're more just trying to be a fun, effective horror movie than anything else. Like there's Mm -hmm. no bigger statement. And especially the second one, there's no like overlying message to them. They're they're just intended to be fun. I think the first one trying to be fun in the, the way that like it's really effective and like scary and menacing and surprising and shocking. The second one, is just trying to be fun in the sense of just being straight up fun. So fun with the the torture aspects of it, like a, a fun horror movie with uh, cringe scenes, you know, where and stuff like yeah, that. I think yeah, I they're, they're they're punctuated by cringe scenes. Like it's not the the crux of it. Like I think the Saw movies are. I think Hostels get a bit of a bad rap because they came out with the Saw movies mm-hmm. when it was like the focus of the Saw movie is like what crazy way are these people gonna die? And you basically just move scene to scene in that with like waiting for the next moment. I think the Hostel movies have more than that to them. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, we can, we'll can we get into some more Solo stuff later. I just wanted to ask that well, question. That being said, I don't know if Eli Roth has any greater statements in him to make. I think he's just like a shameless horror fan. He comes from the place of like John Carpenter movies, yeah. not necessarily like Pasolini movies. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing either. I mean, like Halloween is great 
Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there's a place for that, right? There's a whole group of people out there that love horror movies and love violent slasher horror movies. Right. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Not I, my cup of tea, but... Yeah, I guess my thinking is the reason I haven't watched Hostel is because I, I'm not super into, you know, like that horror aspect. And I was wondering if there, like, there is any deeper meaning or anything like that uh, to make it worth my while to watch these movies. It's these a little movies. bit more disturbing in its principle than, than Saw because the idea of a Hostel seems kind of realistic. Like, there's, like, a club of, like, really rich people in, like, Eastern Europe that travel there. Oh, hostels are real. Yeah, well, but, <laughs> I know hostels are real. Oh, hostels are real. The, what I'm saying, happens in them isn't a hostel. Yeah. They're staying at hostels, and then this thing happens to them that Mike is describing. So okay, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> so basically, like, the point of hostel is that there's, like, this underground club full of really, really rich people that like to travel to Eastern Europe from everywhere in the world and basically pay a lot of money to kill tourists that get kidnapped mm -hmm. yeah, and tricked in into being there and kill them in any way you want to. You could light them on fire. You could cut their fingers off. You could do what, literally whatever. You could rape them. Yeah, you shoot could, them in the head. You could do whatever you want. Yeah, you can make it quick. You can make it last days. So yeah. the idea that like rich people pay a lot of money for like anonymous victims is a, is a kind of a disturbing idea because it's not like now, you know, sex trafficking and things like that. Like these things aren't, super out there concepts. Right. So like the idea of it itself is pretty disturbing. Although I don't know if there's any statement at all other than just face value. Yeah. Or... Yeah. I don't think so. I think you're right. And what is different, like it is more menacing to have this like organization of all these people that are interested in this idea, as opposed to something like saw uh, where you have a, a mastermind psychopath guy who's pulling all of these strings. And it's like, you kind of think like, well, if I run in the chances that I run into this one person in the world, who's a psychopath are pretty slim, you mm -hmm. know, whereas this is a whole organization that is worldwide in hostile. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. It's, it's a good idea for a horror movie. Yeah. yeah and there's, yeah. there's things that work. So I, I recommend, I honestly recommend watching them if you're into that type of movie and haven't uh, watched them yet. Cause the, and maybe even if you're not, cause they're nothing like the saw movies or any bad torture porn movie that spun off of saw okay sure so yeah that's it for the hostile movies for me and uh, mike do you want to go next sure so this week i haven't really been watching a whole lot other than the movies that we're actually reviewing for the podcast but i did watch one of the special features for the last jedi that came out this week and it's called the director and the jedi and it's like an hour and a half behind the scenes documentary that chronicles the making of the movie follows Ryan Johnson from the writing process all the way through production. And uh, it's really fascinating. One of the best behind the scenes documentaries like on a special feature that I've seen in, in quite some time. It's up there with like that Magnolia documentary, which if any of you guys are fans of the movie Magnolia, there's a really great documentary about the making of that movie as well. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you guys, have you guys heard of this at all? The director and the Jedi? Yeah. I actually got a chance to watch it as well. This Did you like it? Yeah, absolutely. I loved it. This is one of those films that could have been released on its own by itself. It, I mean, it could have had a theatrical release because it's a, it's a solid hour and a half. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't I, have to be a special feature. They could have just sold it. Yeah, it could have been a completely separate thing. But the fact that it comes along with the movie and so often with these big, mo these big budget movies, what we get is 30 minutes of everybody praising everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's not a realistic look at what's happening. This was so great. Yeah, absolutely. Like, well, in it, you get to see Mark Hamill struggling so hard with the fate of his character in that movie. Like, he's waiting so long to come back as Luke Skywalker, you know. And spoilers for The Last Jedi, at the end of the movie, he, Luke Skywalker, has to sacrifice himself in, like, a really heroic way. And, man, Mark Hamill was just struggling with that so much. And it's so interesting to see, like, Ryan Johnson, you know, come up to him and just reason with him. And Mark was, was just trying so hard to give the best performance he could. But, you know, Mark Hamill's not an actor that's in a whole lot of stuff. So this role of Luke Skywalker has been his life, you know. It's not like Harrison Ford where he was in a million things after Star Wars. He was a voice actor, but Luke Skywalker is important to him, you know? Right. It's really fascinating to see him come to terms with it. It's fascinating to see Carrie Fisher's last interviews. And the whole time, everyone is just praising Ryan Johnson and just talking about what, like, a great guy he is. Even the people who, like, Mark Hamill, who 
weren't into the script initially, uh, they have nothing bad to say about Ryan Johnson. Everyone just talks about how he is just an absolute joy to work with. And uh, I think the documentary really gives you like an interesting look into the vibe and the tone that was on set. It's just really great. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure who the director was, but it wasn't like they got someone just random to do it. They actually got uh, an award-winning director, I believe. It mm-hmm. was directed by Anthony Wonke. Anthony Wonk. He's basically directed a bunch of other documentaries, like Ronaldo in 2015. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Basically, he's he's just a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. So they, they got someone who knew what they were doing and not just some studio hack. Right. Anyway, if you like special features and you like seeing really in-depth, behind-the-scenes stuff, give it a shot. It, it shows you some of the inception of some of these ideas and some of like the dismissed artwork and a lot of times Ryan Johnson's talking about why he made certain changes like at one point in the documentary he talks about why he changed the opening scene so that it would just start off with like a much faster pace and so it's just really cool to see the decisions and have them talk about why they made those decisions you know I was surprised by how much of this was actually practical and wasn't CG there's oh I know they they do so much yeah it was really surprising, you know, stuff that I was for sure was CG, like all of Yoda, he was the he was a puppet, you know, and I'm sure there's CG in that scene, but yeah. Yoda was not CG. They even got the original molds from right. Return of the Jedi and, and actually like made a whole new Yoda puppet based on the original molds, which I thought was pretty cool. It's pretty and awesome. there's even like a little segment in the documentary where like Mark Hamill is sitting there watching Frank Oz perform as Yoda. And like you see Mark Hamill just get really emotional and be like, oh, man, this is getting to me. Yeah, nostalgic. Anyway, uh, what about you, Chris? What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, so this week I watched Solo, which we will talk about later. But I needed to cleanse my palate afterwards, so I watched a movie called Don't Think Twice. Uh, it's a movie by Mark, Mike Birbiglia. I don't know yeah. if you guys have ever seen any of his other. He did a lot of stuff on um, This American Life. Didn't oh, he okay. do Sleepwalk with me? Yeah. Sleepwalk with me was actually a piece that he did on This American Life that he kind of stretched out into a movie. Uh, and that's how I was introduced to him was through This American Life. He tells this really hilarious story. If you get a chance, uh, Google it, uh, find it because it's hilarious. But yeah, so Don't Think Twice is about an improv group where one of the members gets into Saturday Night Live, essentially. In the movie, it's called Weekend Live, and how it affects the rest of the group. You know, because one of them's... Mike Birbiglia plays a guy that is, like... I think he's he's 36, and he's living in a dorm room, essentially, because he loves... He teaches improv, and he's in charge of this improv group. And how he's essentially, you know... He's kind of stunted in his growth. He's... Because he's devoted his life to this thing... And he's seen more than one person like pass him up and go into Weekend Live. Uh, so it's oh, right. really this bittersweet look at what it's like to make a choice in your life, to do something that you love, but you're not getting everything that you that all the rest of your friends are getting, you know? Right. So it's like this unfair world. Right. He's not making enough money uh, and stuff like that. But on top of that, a lot of good supporting performances. Keegan Michael Key is in it. He's the one that makes it onto Weekend Live, and then Jillian Jacobs is in it. She's really good. But yeah, it's just a really sweet, enjoyable film. Yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. And it's funny? Don't think twice. It's funny. I don't know. That was. Yeah, it's, it's definitely really funny. <laughs> it's also, it's got this bittersweetness to it, though, that's uh, really cool. Were you trying to make a Bob Dylan reference joke? You'll never know. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, that's Don't Think Twice. That came out in 2016? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, so go check this out on Netflix. It's a really great film. You won't regret it. I think we have one last thing to wrap up before we get into Salo. We got some Criterion releases this week. That's right. We Ooh. are on the Criterion episode, and it kind of works out that that kind of falls... When the Criterion releases comes, the new announcements, these are for June of 2018. And real quick, I'll just list them off, and then we can go in to talk about them. Uh, coming out on June 12th, we have Manila and the Claws of Light, directed by Lino Bracca. It is from the Philippines, 1975. June 19th, we have two films, Bowling for Columbine, the Michael Moore documentary, and mm-hmm. El Sur by Victor Aris, which is a Spanish film from 1983 then the last two both coming out on june 26th is female trouble by john waters from Mm -hmm. 1974 and last but not least the virgin spring by ingmar bergman and that is an upgrade 
from a DVD. Do you think with the Igmar Bergman that they are prepping for his birthday and they're going to release a big box set of all his films? I feel like if they were doing that, they wouldn't release some, like separately. The Virgin Spring separately on its own. In the past, I think when they've released a film that is in a box set, but separately, it's always come later. Like okay. They did the BBS box set, and then later on they released Five Easy Pieces as its own okay. thing. And, and the did same they with, release Five Easy Pieces on its own? They did. I didn't know that. That's yeah. cool. But yeah, um, so what's like the most interesting one to you guys? Or the most exciting? Uh, Virgin Spring, hands down for me. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet. Uh, yeah. But I love Ingmar Bergman. I would, yeah. you know, I need to get more into Ingmar Bergman for sure. It's great. Yeah, Virgin Spring is one of my favorite Ingmar Bergman movies that I've seen. I would be interested to watch Bowling for Columbine again, but also I could also not watch it again. I watched I'm it. Fine with that. I watched it less than a year ago. How does it age? It, uh, good and not good. Like it, it is worse when you factor in Michael Moore's reputation. Sure. Because <laughs> you start to question a lot more of what's going on it and the information that you're being given but is it entertaining and easy to watch and like fun quote quotations right. fun movie to watch yeah i kind of wish with bowling for columbine that given the situation that we are in now right now like with the the walkout happening uh for gun control and stuff like that i wish this was a better movie uh, a, a movie that looked more in depth at gun control and things like that uh, unfortunately i think with michael moore like justin was saying you get this one-sided uh opinion and it doesn't really dive in you get charlie chaplin doing goofy things you know in the, the cuts and of it and stuff like that i i just don't i don't think that this furthers any kind of co any cause except for his right yeah well i think hopefully that's where some of the special features maybe they revisit feel better yeah hopefully hopefully they're not like just more of you know pushing what he thinks so although I, I mean i tend to agree with a lot of what he's saying in the movie but hopefully yeah. they don't just like push more of like the one-sided agenda maybe there's a little bit more discussion about the one-sidedness of the documentary and stuff maybe not or maybe that one-sidedness also isn't as dishonest as a lot of people in texas who we talked to would probably have us believe sure i think the big dishonesty <laughs> came with like uh, fahrenheit 9-11. Well, I wouldn't even say dishonesty, I think, is the wrong word, because I think he has something that he's saying. I just feel like he's not doing anything to help. You know, he is just furthering the divide be between Republicans and Democrats, right? Or between people that are for gun control and people that are anti-gun control, right? He's not Maybe, bridging that. I would also challenge anyone to make any kind of documentary touching on gun control. That's not somewhat. Where, like, one side would be like, this isn't dividing at all. Hey, you know what I mean? If it makes a case against your side you're gonna say that it's like made up and that he's not someone to listen to yeah I, I guess i just feel like it doesn't give any answers necessarily and i haven't seen it in a long time so maybe it does give answers but it, not any substantial answers uh for me uh, anyways that's just what i feel yeah well i think i think we can agree that it is about a very important event in our history columbine mm -hmm. and gun control is a huge issue in the country that divides people. And so to have a documentary about that, I, I think it's an important movie. And I think with some of the criterions, it's like whether you like it or not, you, you can't necessarily argue against the, the fact that it is important and, you know, interesting to some degree. Uh, I, I'd agree with that, that it, it belongs in the criterion collection, that it's important enough. Yeah. And real quick, I, I think for me, I am excited about the Virgin spring, but the one that gets me the most excited is El Sir which I have not seen. That's the Victor Aris movie, but he did The Spirit of the Beehive. And oh, nice. this is a movie he made after The Spirit of the Beehive. And so I'm, I've always wanted to watch it and I never have. And I think this is a uh, brand new to the Criterion Collection. This isn't like an update from a DVD or anything like that, but I'm just really excited to see another film by him because I've only seen Spirit of the Beehive. And I think that one is really, really good. Like Spirit one of, of my favorite. Great. Yeah, it's one yeah. of my favorite Criterion films. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm excited to see it now too. I didn't know that he directed that but now i'm more excited than i was yeah all right guys i think we should wrap it up and move into solo because i think solo we're gonna have a lot of shit to talk about so <laughs> yep fair enough so all right, cool all right let's do it
Yeah, before we get in, I just want to make sure that everybody knows there's going to be some frank and graphic sexual dialogue going on in this movie. It's a very tough movie to talk about, you know, without doing that. So if you've got little ones around, or even if you don't, it's going to be some uh, graphic talk here in a little bit. Very true. Although if you clicked on a podcast called Sallow or the 120 Days of Sodom. But do you think there are people that listen that don't know what that movie is? And It's called the 120 Days of Sodom. <laughs> well, but... Like, I, before I watched it, I had a pretty good idea what I was in for. I always thought of Sodom and Gomorrah. In which fact, I, that's I why I watched well, it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the intention is to think of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and if right, you remember Sodom, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. and the reason that that happened to them. Right, right. But, I mean, like, there, I think there are people, like my mom, that may not know <laughs> what she's getting into. Yeah. Well, if Chris's mom, stop listening. <laughs> yeah. Stop listening. This is bad, naughty talk <laughs> about to happen. All right, yeah, let's get into it. So, Salo was directed by Pier Paolo Pasolini, who is an Italian filmmaker. The film is Italian. Uh, he made a lot of films that I think were kind of uh, overly sexual. I haven't seen any of his other films, but I did, you know, hear and come across in like the special features and other places doing my research for this that some of his other films had a lot of sexuality in them and like uh, some of them had some homoeroticism in it. So, I think that the. the some of the graphic nature of Salo is not entirely outside of his wheelhouse. Although I do think it goes like a a good step further than some of his other films. I have not seen any of his other movies. Yeah. I haven't seen any of his, uh, any of his other movies either, but I, in my research, this was almost uh, a rejection of his earlier movies, like where he was trying to kind of reset and a condemnation almost of his earlier films as well. Like a reinvention of himself. Yeah. Some of the people in the, special features of the DVD like that are being interviewed that that knew uh, Pierre Paolo they were saying that basically he started to like hate sex you know to put it very simply like he started to dislike it and dislike like what he had done for been or in his other movies for like putting that stuff in there and yeah this was a response to that like mm-hmm. his mindset towards it which I find really interesting yeah and it was actually based on a book called the 120 days of sodom which was actually written in like 1785 but wasn't published until like 1904 yeah that's actually a really interesting story apparently so the marquis de sod is the author of it have you guys seen quills with uh, joaquin phoenix kate winslet and jeffrey rush in it no uh no. jeffrey rush plays the Mar- marquis de sod where he's in prison for all his writings because they're so graphic that they put him in prison because he must be crazy uh, well, actually, in real life, this that was when he wrote the 120 Days of Sodom, and it was actually on some paper that he had stuck behind a wall that didn't get discovered till much later, like uh, I think hundreds hundreds of years later. And then they discovered that it was Marquis de Sade that wrote it, and he it's not a complete book either. Yeah, I hear that the first part of the book is actually like written in a lot of detail, but the other like three fourths of the book are kind of just like highlights and summaries and he even has some of like his own notes still left in the actual text of the book because he never got a chance to go back and finish it yeah apparently we'll get into what solo is but in um the 120 days of sodom that marquita sod wrote it is definitely a darkly comic because it's it's so absurd there is a, a guy that wants to like three holes in a woman isn't enough for him so he has to make another hole so he can fuck her in a different way uh so it's just this really dark comedy that he, uh, that he wrote an absurdist sounds hilarious yeah yeah sounds like a laugh out loud time <laughs> it also sounds pretty accurate to the overall tone and vibe of what ended up becoming sallow exactly yeah, yeah. and and i think going to the idea that this book was written in when like the 1700s mm-hmm. and didn't 1785. come out 1785 i just want to make crazy. The, the point that like there's a lot of people that constantly say like that the the world is getting worse and like right. there's more pornography there's more violence uh, in like the media and and stuff like that but like this stuff has been around for centuries and centuries and probably since like man learned to like speak and draw and write it's just <laughs> that know? we used to get locked up for this kind of talk yeah. yeah so it is more prominent now because it's more accepted yeah i think or we have more rules of like and there's more media. freedom of freedom of speech <laughs> yeah. and yeah you can say uh, what you want yeah. More lack of censorship. You can say what you want. I don't necessarily have to accept it, you know, but you can say what you want that's, if that's your thing. <laughs> At least in most places of the world. That's very true. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I just I just find like examples of these this sort of thing from the past to be very interesting in comparison to you know things like the like rap music creates violence sort of ideas or like pornography creates you know more demented minds. So I think that's really interesting that this can be written in 1785, but for wealthy aristocratic type guys, that kind of character translates really well to a World War II setting, or it would work really well today. Like, it's a, there's a timelessness about the wealthy taking advantage of the small people that is a kind of a timeless human condition type story. Yeah, I mean, I think the majority of the world is not the rich or uh, aristocratic people. Since the dawn of humanity, no matter when, people aren't that different as we were then. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about just like the basic plot of what's going on in this. So you you have these four or five, I think, aristocratic guys. Fascists. Yeah. And and it's set in 1940s Italy when like the fascist regime was at its height. And it's set in the fictitious nation of Salo. And they basically take all of these kids to this estate or manor or something like that. And they subject them to all kinds of harsh things like ridicule, sexual molestation, sexual perversions, and just all kinds of really like shocking, demeaning stuff. Okay. So this takes place between 1944 and 45, but I think that's near the end of the fascist control in Italy. So, like, I was watching the special features, and they were kind of talking about how you can hear bombs in the background and, and certain radio broadcasts letting you know that, like, the fascists' time in Italy is almost up. Like, the fighting is reaching them. And so, shortly after the end of this movie, those guys were probably overthrown and, and, and had to leave it, Italy altogether. Yeah. I th- yeah, I think uh, I did read that, actually. So, you're, you're right there. I don't know how much that actually affects the movie for no, me. No, it, it doesn't, but I think it's interesting knowing that, like, knowing that there is there are clues as to what is going on in the outside world. I do think it ties into the end of the film further. So well, I guess we can wait till we get to the end of the film. But I, I do think that there is an important thing that happens at the end of the film that ties into it being the end of the war. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll hold that thought. But so first, do you guys want to talk about like your experience with this movie? Any expectations you had, or what like you know what your experience was like watching it this time, or if you've seen it before the first time? Sure, I'll go first. I've actually this is probably my third time to see this movie. I watched it a long time ago out of curiosity because it was just one of those infamous movies that you have to see, you know, and I was going through my phase where I was literally watching any foreign movie, any Criterion movie I could get a hold of. So I watched this movie late at night by myself, and I didn't take much from it the first time, but I ended up getting it on DVD at like a movie trading company sale one time, and where it has basically been with me for years I probably showed it to someone once a few years ago, but this time, I think this is the first time it's actually really, like, I've really paid attention and really, I I don't I I guess it disturbed me a lot more this time than it did the first couple times I watched it, and I think I was a lot younger then, and so I think there was probably like a, maybe a certain, uh, I was a little bit removed from it the first couple times I saw it, but this time, I guess being older, it, it just, it upset me a lot more. Do you think the first couple of times there's more like, this is a dare? Like, can I get through this movie? Well, so like the first time it was a lot like Justin watching Hostel, right? I wasn't, I didn't know what I was watching. I, I didn't know it was going to be like an, an art house type horror movie. Mm-hmm. I thought it was just going to be like a disturbing movie. You know, I right. didn't, I didn't know, I wasn't ready to absorb anything else. Cause I don't know, I must've been 18 or 19 years old. I don't know how old I was, but I was pretty young. I think that was it because we watched it around the same time because we were we were hanging out then, and yeah. I think that I was with you when you bought it and I hadn't heard of it and you told me mm. about it and so eventually I went out and found it on my own. I, I used to think it was a lot more comedic and and it is comedic now still, but I I remember just shrugging off and laughing a lot more the first couple of times whereas this time I didn't laugh as much. <laughs> I don't know it just. It hit me a lot differently this time. I don't know if you had a similar reaction to it, Justin. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, well, you, it had come to me through you for that first time. And I think the first time it's very shocking and you're kind of reacting to everything that's going on and trying to, like Chris said, I think see if you can get through it. 
see if you can make it. There are times where you're like, how much worse is this going to get? You know, and you're really focused right. on the actual events that are going on. So that's kind of how I watched it the, the first time. The second time I showed it to somebody, I don't remember who, but it was in college. I might have been there. We might have shown it to somebody. Yeah, we might have been. We might have had the same second viewing experience. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was more focused on like, check out how messed up this movie is, and yeah. like watching Look at this thing we can show you. Yeah, and watching their reaction. That was probably seven years ago, roughly. And now, as you said, we're older. I'm watching it, and I had two people watch it with me: my my girlfriend and then a friend um, who was involved one day in like a conversation about disturbing movies. So I was like, you got to come over when I'm watching solo. If you haven't seen that, but this time I paid more attention to what was going on. And I think to what you said is like, I think the concepts and the message of the movie is what got to me more this time. Like when I was, I'm past like the shockingness, the shock factor of it, you know, the the disturbing factor. I'm to the point where like the actual message and what he's, talking about is like a lot scarier than the idea of like the the physical actual things that are happening to the people you know what i mean sure and i think maybe a lot of it has to do with uh getting older and paying attention to the state of the world a little bit more yeah to exactly where this isn't quite as like when when we were like i don't know 12 years ago when i first watched it or whatever you know the world felt a little different <laughs> politically awesome. and i was a lot more naive I also, it sounds like... It seems less like a fairy tale now. You know? Right. To me, it sounds like, and I'm kind of inferring on you guys, so you tell me if I'm wrong, but like the first two times, it's like what you would do if you got on the internet and you're like, look at this fucked up thing that happened, uh, and you look up two two girls in a cup or whatever, you know, and right. it's, just, it's just the <laughs> right. shocking value. It was and, the novelty of seeing something weird. Yeah, this crazy thing, whereas two girls in a cup has no value i i don't think i haven't seen it but um it it doesn't have a lot of value where i think this is trying to say something and we can discuss whether it actually has value or whether it's worth it um later but yeah i think that that's what you guys uh that's the difference between the two viewings or the three or whatever sure and you you have to be ready to take something from it too you know right i think a lot of it has to do with the maturity of the viewer yeah. Yeah. So what was your ex- expectation and experience, Chris? Yeah. So my expectations were, um, I mean, this is a movie I've known about. You guys have probably told me about this movie and talked about it. I am not a big torture horror movie guy. Like, Did you I, cry? <laughs> I gagged, uh, for <laughs> sure. Um, I, I'm not a big torture horror movie guy. I have to be convinced to do those things. And, and you know, because of the podcast, I had to watch it. I, I don't know that... I gain I, that I'm happy that I watched it. To be honest, I do think that there's value maybe in there, but at at the same time, I'm not sure whether it's worth it. But yeah, my movie experience was I watched it um, by myself. I had invited somebody else over, and I was like, well, "We're gonna watch this crazy movie." Uh, fortunately, they couldn't make it, and I'm glad because I, <laughs> I didn't want to watch it with anybody else. I'm really interested in finding out what Justin's girlfriend thought about it, but ultimately. Yeah, I was shocked. One of the things I found interesting was the about my own reaction to the film was the the circle of shit uh, was more appalling to me than when they are torturing them. You know, uh, eating poop is more is worse than watching people get tortured, and I, I found that a surprising reaction in myself. Um, you know, you'd think, well, they're mutilating bodies. Uh, shouldn't that be worse than eating poop? Or I would argue I think- that eating poop is torture. No, well, it is. Well, I think what my, I know what you're saying though. Yeah, I think what my guess would be is that we're a little desensitized to torture, I would and, probably and like agree. physical mutilations from like more standard horror films, mm-hmm. or standard by today's standards. Well, that's my reaction. I, I'm really excited to dive into a more in depth talk with you guys. Yeah. Do you want to know what the people I watched it with thought? Oh yeah, yeah. We wanted to talk about yeah. That. The so my girlfriend. I guess we had built this movie up for her like when we had first told her about it me being we being myself and whatever friends were around when we were talking about it because you know like i said she's refused to watch this movie or even like she doesn't even laugh when i like joke like guess what we're watching tonight solo which i've made the joke a hundred times and i don't think she laughed the first time Um, (laughs) now you can't make that joke anymore i know but she said that it was not as bad as she expected 
Like she did not enjoy it at all in any way, but it was totally watchable for her. There were times where she did have to look away, but ultimately they were far and few in between and, and she could watch it again, but she doesn't want to. Well, let me ask you this. Did you guys enjoy this film? Uh, because I don't know that this is a film to be enjoyed. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think that you can gain pleasure from watching this film in any, in any sort of way. Like, not just sexually, of right, course, right, right. but like even just like have a good time like you can in like another horror film or mm-hmm. even like you could some people can have a good time watching Saw, you know, mm-hmm. and that's just basically the end of this movie extended out through an entire movie. <laughs> right. And you can have an enjoyment in that, I think, but I don't think you can enjoy this movie on that level. No, I don't think so, but I was noticing this time that it doesn't feel as excruciating as something like a horror movie, right? So, like, I think the reason, and I'm going to attempt to speak for someone whom I wasn't there <laughs> uh, to get their opinion from, but, like, your girlfriend, right? She she said she could watch it again, but she just doesn't want to. And it sounds like she's not big on horror movies, so I wouldn't think that she would want to watch, like, Hostel again or something like that. Is that fair to say? She really likes to watch horror movies but the ones where people are getting tortured and like uh-huh. they're screaming a lot, she uh-huh. can't deal with. Like she also won't watch like Saving Private Ryan, like because right. the beginning okay. it has been built up for her where it's just a bunch of people dying and screaming. It's a, right. that sort of thing bothers her. But she does like to watch horror films. Like she's the one that insisted that we watched, you know, Get Out and like uh, sure. It Follows and The Witch because she likes those sort yeah. of things. Those those are horror movies for wieners though. Um, <laughs> there's nothing scary about any of those movies, even though they're good. She listens to the podcast, so she's going to hear you say that. Uh, well, <laughs> tough. Uh, uh, sorry, Nicole. Anyway, so but what I, the point I was going to try to make is that I think the reason it, it feels that way, or maybe it wasn't as bad on her as she as she thought, is because it, it's not filmed like a horror movie. Like usually, horror movies, you're in the point of view of the victim. And you're trying to escape. So there's a certain comfort in there. And, like, there's a moral compass in the movie where you're like, this is the person I am with and identifying with. They are good. This is evil. And they need to get out of there. Yeah. And but I don't want to movie... see anything bad happen to this person that I've grown right. attached to. Exactly. But in this movie, the only people we spend any significant time with to get to know are the fascists. Right. And we don't like them at all at any point. And we don't ever get to know any of the kids. They're all just like young bodies that are less and less as the as the movie goes on or or whatever, right? So I don't think that there's this comfort level of getting to hang out with the victim. So it's not holding your hand and telling you exactly how to feel. Looking at it sort of like objectively from a third party perspective and, and it's showing you these fascists and, and portraying them as these goofy comical weirdos that in any other movie you would be laughing at these clowns. Right. We are uh, voyeurs along with the the fascists. Right. Well, and, and we're watching them have fun in these perverse ways, and the film almost doesn't even judge them at all, whereas like a horror movie would. It would paint them as the evil things that you have to escape. And I think that maybe says something towards like why it, do- it, it doesn't register the same way as something like Hostile or like Human Centipede or whatever you know insert disturbing movie here right yeah you don't get the emotions of like like human centipede it's like that's so disgusting and icky and like i hope they painful. Know, i hope they escape yeah you, know? you, you have no emotional like raw emotional like for, i guess like in a, a human sense of like where you want them to survive or like not feel pain like you said it's very objective there's actually there's kind of a lot of wide shots while things are going on you know some mm-hmm. of the more disturbing stuff so we're looking at it from a distance you and also i believe other than like the opening credits and maybe end credits in a way there's no score throughout this movie any music is like diegetic it's from and, and diegetic music is music that is coming from a source that's on screen so like it's coming from a piano or a radio and mm-hmm. a lot of that music is contradictory to like the mood of what's going on but there's basically no score to give you that emotional feel like we don't get like a sinister sound when we see the bad guys you exactly know? No so close-ups I think, or anything. Yeah, so you're you're forced to just watch and take at like face value what is going on in the film, right? And that's a disturbing way to look at things, right? You don't have that emotional 
comfort. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get the filmmakers like basically holding your hand and telling you what is good and what is bad. Your moral compass is there to do that for you. But the way it's filmed is like, if you're a good person, probably it's contradicting your moral compass. Yeah. You know. And sometimes like cold hard facts and numbers are more disturbing to look at than like a story on the news. You know, because it's painted a certain way. Right, Even if exactly. it's painted to be more disturbing, that sometimes isn't as disturbing as looking at just like the cold hard numbers on like, you know, we talked about Bowling for Columbine, but like the cold hard numbers on like gun deaths or school shootings, you know? Right. And I actually did think about to make a modern example, a totally different movie, totally different vibe, but what they're doing by giving like the characters are giving us no like attachment to the characters in like name. Like I, I thought a little bit of Dunkirk how that we can experience the event of Dunkirk in a very generalized way because the characters don't have backstories. We do have in Dunkirk, like characters that you follow and get to know and like see the world through, but like they could be any soldier, right? They could be anybody. Right. And I think that's one thing that I really liked about Dunkirk because it, it was, it gave the movie a different feel, a different effectiveness than, you know, maybe a movie where we knew about the characters past the soldiers past saw what was going on at home, knew their names, uh, and I think something similar is going on with Solo here. Yeah. But I think maybe the point is different. Like in Dunkirk, it seems like we don't know anything about these characters because we are to be them. They are our surrogates, and we are to s- try to survive with them and, and, and think about their survival experience and not be caught up on, like, the plot mechanics of, like, who does he have at home? You know, what's his name? Like, yeah. what's the what's the B character waiting for him on his arc, you know? Whereas in Sallow, it seems like the reason that you don't get to know anybody is kind of because the point of the movie is to show you how, like, the human body can become, like, an object almost or, like, a a thing to be bought and sold, you know? Like, like, it's, a, like it's an item rather than, like, a people that you get attached to. Yeah, I think it's almost a condemnation of us. Right, because we're watching this, we are part of the problem. Does that make sense? And I think that's what he's trying to say, uh, or maybe one of the things he might be trying to say. You know, if, as we think about it, us just watching, he's calling out us as the viewer, uh, especially at the end of the movie. And I don't know if we want to get into it, but I think this is a good point where they're all watching the torture happen and they have their binoculars. And then, you know, the one guy switches it around and we can see the whole thing. We are them. We are part of the problem you know he's yeah so he's condemning us for following along with it It, it, and that's why i don't think it's a movie that's necessarily meant to be enjoyed because he is putting everything that happens in real life out there and condemning us for going along with it yeah i think if you enjoy the film up to that point that is pasolini pasolini being like you shouldn't be enjoying this film like because that is the one point where we go into any sort of point of view right where we actually start seeing through the eyes of the aristocrats because like and if you've been enjoying anything like you know there was a lot of talk about when the film came out that it was overly pornographic and the idea of pornography is to enjoy it right Mm -hmm. and i think if you are enjoying the film at any point and all of a sudden you're seeing through the aristocrats eyes like like you said it's a condemnation but i think the whole film isn't necessarily meant to be a condemnation until that very end part. And unless like you're enjoying it, like if you're watching it and I don't think any of us enjoy watching the film or enjoyed it or got any pleasure out of it. So I think at that point where it does go into the point of view, if we haven't enjoyed it to that point, I think we're okay. Like I don't necessarily feel condemned. Well, back when it came out, right. It was like, is this pornographic or is this something else? You know, I, and I can see the argument of why someone with a different sensibility, could consider it pornographic. With a caveat of saying that person probably doesn't watch porn, right? Right. Because this movie is not filmed to be stimulating at any point. No. There is nothing in this movie that is meant to titillate, which is, in my definition of porn, what the point of pornography is, right? And I'm sure people could argue with me on that, and that's a whole different topic. But I don't think the director was like, all right, I'm going to make everyone enjoy this until the end. And so I think, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's not designed in any way to titillate. 
So that would be my argument for the condemnation of us as the viewer, because in his previous films, uh, they were sometimes made for titillation, and but it, they don't necessarily go far enough. Uh, whereas in this film, he's just showing you everything. Does that make sense? Uh, where oftentimes those titillating movies skip over some of the more profane acts that happen on uh, the screen. On the Fade to Black documentary that's on the special features of the Criterion release, there's like actually like a section where Pasolini says that he didn't think that the kids of that day were going to get it. Like he thought it would be completely lost on them because of like they grew up in like a different culture, right? The, con- the, consumer- the consumerism culture had started to take over at that point. And he saw like a real divide between his generation and like the younger generations. And he was saying that, yeah, that he just didn't think like they had different values. So it would, it, some of it might be completely lost on them. And, and one of the historians even said that like eating the shit in the movie was actually like likening to eating American junk food. Right. We eat McDonald's all the time because right. the man gives it to us kind of thing. Right. And so like a, part of this could be like by the end of it, you know, uh, it kind of shows you like what humans can endure and what we can learn to live with. And I think a lot of it comes from like, if, if it's a, a condemnation of consumerism, then a lot of it could be like showing how we invite this into our lives willingly after a while, you know, like we get so brainwashed by it that eventually it's all there is. And, and we can't, we're not who we were anymore. You know, pretty soon we're, we're eating the shit and we're taking part in this voyeuristic terrible thing and all of that comes from being kind of coerced that way through the culture you know that was changing at the time yeah and being surrounded by it and and engulfed in it right exactly and that you can't you can't do much but eventually adapt and acclimate to it yeah which i think if we can segue into like talking about the parts of the movies where they're sitting around listening to stories Ugh. Like I, we can kind of like touch on that generally, I think, rather than going to like each individual story. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is some of the more disturbing. Yeah, that moments to me, that's of the, the movie worst part me. are those stories. Uh, yeah. Hearing about when those women were children and like all the terrible things that happened to them. Yeah, but the the whole idea of engulfing them with this culture, it's like when they're not being abused, they're sitting around listening to stories that normalize all of being the abuse that's that's happening to them, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And and Pasolini was really anti like conformist and going along with like the status quo or the way that things are just because the the that's the way that things are right mm-hmm. and so I think I just the stories like looking at them in that light really <laughs> are powerful in some ways more than the actual events because that's where the brainwashing is happening yeah absolutely it's. It's even like in the downtime, whenever nothing bad is happening to them, it's st- like technically right. It's still it's still breaking down. Yeah, well, it's it's interwoven. You know, we keep going yeah. back to the stories, but like we get stories that kind of build up the events that are about to happen, and then when those are done, we get stories that lead up to the next type of events. Yeah, well, the what are they called? The four. Oh, the, like the president, the duke. Yeah. Well, okay. So the aristocrats, the four aristocrats, the fascists. Yeah, the fascists. That's what the word I'm. So the fascists, they really are taking their cues off the stories, it seems like, because the the woman will tell her story and they're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Let's try that. And that's, you know, leads into the, the rest of the segment of, of what's happening. So and they're not even it's I get the feeling that if those if the whores weren't there, the ones that tell the stories, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves. You know, like they wouldn't have any ideas uh, as what to do next. I, th- I think so. I think I think there's a lot to read into those stories and something that i found interesting during them is that each one also ends with like a reward of some sort for like the woman who's telling the story it's like you know i was seven or whatever and i went in with this guy who had an enormous penis and he came all over my face and at the end he handed me like 40 gold or whatever and and like that's part of what they're doing is like setting up that like doing these things does end in a reward, right? Does end in like good feelings, wealth. And if you look at like commercials and going into the idea of consumerism and con- conformity, like I guess we'll use the example of like the old smoking ads, right? <laughs> like you got the idea that like when you're smoking, you're part of the cool crowd, right? And that's one of the right. reasons we stopped. They outlawed those ads where like you can't see people smoking and they had Joe Camel who like right marketed to kids. But like it seemed like, 
with smoking comes great things. And you see that with like Coke too, which I think is like everyone agrees is like awful for you. But during the Olympics, you'll see world-class athletes training and then drinking a Coke, right? And it seems Mm -hmm. like, well, these athletes can drink Coke. They drink Coke and then they're athletes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like a subtle way. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like normalizing like the bad stuff and like, but tying it in with like some reward, something that gets you somewhere, gets you to a different place than you were when you started. So it's not just like be part of our life and this is, or follow us and we will reward you for doing these things. Um, if you're wearing your Axe body spray. Yeah. That's just why I really was disturbed by the stories more. I was thinking about them in that light (laughs) of like compare them as like metaphorically to like commercials and how we're marketed to. Right. So, at the beginning of the movie, they're each given these rules that the fascists make up and say, you can't break these rules or it will be punishable by death or, or whatever, you know, loss of a limb, something terrible. Eventually, you know, they, they do break the rules, or at least a few of them do. And then as, as soon as they call one out, they'll end up turning on the others for breaking the other rules, right? So it seems like they get so indoctrinated into into thinking like, Oh, oh, instead of like any kind of empathy towards one another, they just sell one another out and almost judge one another for breaking those arbitrary rules that the fascists made up. Like there's a photograph under one girl's pillow and another girl rats her out. But why would that girl, I mean, I guess she's trying to save her own skin, but it seems like the kids are actually starting to believe in these rules themselves and think, oh, well, they're breaking your rules. You know, she has a photograph or, you know, those two girls are actually into each other and that's breaking the rules and we all know that's bad. Whereas it almost seems like heartlessness rather than self-preservation at that point. Yeah, that's an interesting sequence because a lot of that happened in when the Germans occupied different countries, people would rat each other out in order to survive, right? Uh, But at the very end of that sequence, because there's like four different times, like there's a ladder he goes up, he finds the picture, then he finds two lesbians having sex, then they rat out. Like, because one of the, the, the worst rules was that was punishable by death was having normal sex, heterosexual sex. Actually, the word would be consensual heterosexual sex was like the worst crime you could commit. You would be killed by it. And so finally leads up to the boy that is having sex with the, uh, the maid. maid. At the very end, they're going to kill him. But he gives this communist salute uh, with a fist up in the air, uh, mm-hmm. which is definitely uh, a, how do you say his name? Pasolini thing to do. He was, Pasolini was very communist. So, you know, he's standing up to the fascists. Uh, and I, I thought that was an interesting sequence. Yeah, I think what's interesting about that particular moment when he like puts his fist in the air and does like the communist symbol is like their reaction because they almost start to like drop their their guns guns. right and you think like what are they going to do and of course they shoot them anyways but their reaction i i think it's from like the idea that someone would stand up to them because at this point they they get their way so much and like they have complete control over these people that like I, they just seem shocked almost that like anyone would contradict them that openly to their face. Cause they've been trying to set up this regime where they have ultimate power. And ultimately I think that's what they're, they're getting off on as much as anything else is the power over these people. Right. They're, they're almost not interested in sex at all. Like there's very little sex in this movie. Uh, it, th- I think there's only two or three times where we actually see the sex act happening. That's not foreplay. But yeah, there's very little sex in this movie. They are getting off on other things, whether it's the torture or the the shit eating. Um, I don't know. There's 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 a pretty good amount of sex. There's like a there's like there's the rape scene at the at the lunch table where like the the naked girl who like I mean, drops she drops the, stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she drops the thing. Like the soldier guy, like, one of the four soldiers, starts raping her. The fuckers. And then the president is... comes and he's like you know have sex with me instead you know and then so he switches to that guy and then there's like the uh there's actually like a like a straight up um sex scene between is it which one is it in one of the soldiers like the the the, gay sex scene after the marriage yeah that is the bishop with yeah which i guess maybe that's there's only like two or three maybe i'm missing some but well, there's those, it, it seemed like a lot. Yeah, those two scenes. It does seem like a lot. Uh, but And then the only other scene is where they are having uh, one of the, the whores 
uh, after the original couple gets married, the mm-hmm. horror is orally stimulating uh, the, one of the guy that got married, and then one of the fuckers is stimulating the girl that got married. Um, and then they, they stop, and even w- when they are about to copulate, the actual married couple, um, they make them stop because that's yeah. not, you know. Yeah, well, I think everything is done for this idea of sexual arousal. So it feels like there's maybe more like actual sex, but like, you know, the the peeing on somebody or like right. eating shit or whatever, it's all done under the, the veil of sexual arousal. So there is a lot of like sexual content yeah things yeah going I, on. I would agree with that but actual so sex yeah it feels like there's more than there is i think but i guess my point was that like they are shocked at the open defiance and it, that's the one thing that actually affects them because they want power they want these people to be completely obedient so to have someone in the face of death in the face of like where they should be afraid that they're gonna die gives them the communist symbol and openly defies them like it seems like it really has an effect to like lose a little bit of power over somebody they don't seem to enjoy that kind of takes the pleasure out of it usually whenever they're torturing or killing people they're having a lot of fun with it yeah because the people are afraid and like crying or whatever they they seem to get off more on that Mm -hmm. but when someone doesn't conform and doesn't follow the rules and and die by their rules begging i guess it probably takes a lot of the the power dynamic from them like you can kill him but you can't like beat all of them you know you can't tame all of them yeah in, in the way that you want i would like to go a little bit further into the the idea of them ratting each other out because that was another part that was like really disheartening to me like as as a viewer i was just like oh man because like you know you said mike that you think that they're doing it out of like adapting to the rules and becoming so much a part of the rules that they're actually upholding them and ratting someone else out simply because they're not following the rules and like I kind of took it more as like when the shit hits the fan, <laughs> they turn on each other. Yeah, people yeah. are so cowardly that they will rat out somebody else. Like even though they're probably going to be punished, they have this idea that like maybe it'll be lesser for me if I can turn someone else over and give someone else up that's doing something. They're doing something worse than me, so like go to them and maybe I'll survive. But like there was a a comment I think on like humanity and and human nature for like survival that's like really disturbing and like cold to me. Sure. I think this whole movie is, is kind of a statement on how humans learn to adapt to what they're put through, right? Like we can, we can endure so much as a species. They either adapted by lying and trying to save their skin, or they adapted by conforming to the rules and starting to buy into them. But either way, it shows you that on a long enough timeline, humans will adapt to their worst situation even if it's not an admirable thing to do. Yeah. And what do you guys make of the setting of, what did you say, 1944 to 1945, like fascist mm-hmm. Italy? Mm-hmm. But like, does that, that tie in for you guys with like fascism in general and the way that like we look at Nazi Germany now and the rise of like the third rack of like, how could the people ever let that happen? Like we think like that would never happen here because we'd all be aware of it. And maybe it, we would, I'm not going to argue that it would or wouldn't happen. But like you look at Germany, you're like how could the people go along with this idea? You know, I think that is, it's the setting is important to also make a comparison, not just to humanity, but also like fascism in general. And right. Well, so like I was saying earlier, the first couple times I watched this movie, it seems so otherworldly to me, like so old, like these kinds of regimes don't exist, you know, like this is not something I have to think about too hard. But given the political climate today, it goes to show you, like, how easy propaganda can manipulate people's minds and how easy it is for people to just hear something that sounds right and sounds good and then just roll with it. My gut instinct tells me to agree with this, and that's all I need to hear, you know? To me, it's even scarier now in 2018 than it was for me when I watched it in, like, whenever, you know, 2006 or whatever. I understand this movie in a way that I never did before because you can see in the world today, regardless of what your stances on things are, you can see propaganda on major news networks and you can see propaganda all over Facebook and you can see propaganda everywhere and people just buy it hook, line and sinker, you know? Yeah. I think that might be where I might push back a little bit because I, I think like my, uh, Justin was saying earlier, uh, we imagine that 
things are worse than they used to be. And I think that there has always been propaganda, whether it's different today, like where they have news networks as opposed to uh, 50 to 100 years ago. Is sure, but I'm not newspapers. saying it's, it's different or worse now. I'm saying it's the same. I'm saying that looking at the world today, you can see how in a world back then, when there was even less you could do to like educate yourself, you believe what you, what you see. You believe the world is presented to you. Okay, I see. Yeah, and, you know and I, I mean? think you're also and, saying, maybe I'm wrong, but you're also saying that like you can see that now, whereas in 2008 when you were younger. Right, yeah. I'm not saying not. that there's like a one-to-one comparison between today and Nazi fascist Italy. Well, to, t- to take the Facebook thing a little bit further is that you could argue that the Facebook social media bubble that people live in is in a, in a way similar to these kids being taken to this house where they're surrounded by all of this like sexual uh, abusive culture, right? Because Facebook, like it has like the algorithms that you see more of the things that you like and interact mm-hmm. with and the things that you don't like, you see less of. So like, you uh, to going to what you're saying i think is how it is in modern day is that we have these bubbles and like we're in a bubble just like these kids are to an extent right yeah it's obviously it's not the same as being kidnapped and and locked in a house for three months or 124 (laughs) months yeah sure but the point is when you're fed enough bullshit it's human nature to accept it after a certain amount of time you know and i think that's scary yeah, I understand where you're coming from. My my argument would be, I think, that I don't feel connected enough to these kids. or like I think that they're, they may be going along with it, but they're crying, and they're not necessarily happy about it the whole time. Like, at uh, first, some of them. But uh, then at the end, you see the soldiers, uh, they're, just, they're, they're totally along with it. The fuckers were always along with it. There's the four soldiers that were uh, part of it. Uh, Sure. And in the article that I read, they called them the fuckers, and I'm not exactly sure why, but they, they were always a part of it. The one that like raped the girl at the very beginning, they were mm-hmm. always okay with it. Um, I, I'm not sure about the kids that were kidnapped, though. I'm not sure that they, and I'm not trying to argue, or, but I, I'm from my point of view, uh, I don't know that I know enough about them uh, to know that they were upset about it or uh, or going along with it, but because we see the one girl that's upset about her mother that invokes in order to die invokes the name of God, which is against one of their rules. Um, If I can make a couple of of points to that, I think one look at the end torture scene, like who's holding down the people to be tortured and who's holding them. Right. That's other kids who were kidnapped initially. That's not the guards or anybody like that. Right. Um, There's only four guards. Yeah. And then also that goes with like how quickly they, they turn on each other, right? And and that whole scene, it's like well, it's the, like they are adapting to a sense. And then the last point is like, what? Where did the guards come from? They're not much older than the kids. Like I think the leap that one could and is probably intended to make is that these guards were once kidnapped, kidnapped themselves. That's the assumption I always had. Yeah, because they're slightly older. They're the ones that survived. They're the ones that didn't get weeded out and murdered because they couldn't follow the rules. I feel like everybody got murdered, though. Uh, and I'm not saying... Not everyone. I, they're, they're, each each so. of the fascists like is in the hall. Like, like only like four people. Like A girl got burned, a guy got burned, a guy got scalped, and a guy got his tongue removed. The one girl got hung. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and someone got whipped. But like, I guess, there, were eight, there were 18 people, weren't there? Like, at not first, 18 people didn't get killed. Well, at first, but they, I think they went through. I mean, and this is a moot point. I think my assumption was that they were just going through everybody and killing them. And I may have actually misread that too, uh, like because at the end, uh, the people that were holding them down, I assumed were soldiers. I, I didn't think that they. But no, they, I mean, they're naked, just like right. But just like the victims are. Yeah, like, but soldiers had the, the clothes. They were up in there with the voyeur. But the uh, fascists, like, remember the fascists take turns all being voyeurs at the end. Yeah, there's two of them up uh, up top. The soldiers were always in varying arrays of clothed, you know. Sure. But the the way I took it is basically these kids that end up surviving this are likely going to be, like, they're young fascists in the making. I I, I could see Those soldiers, by the end of it, the the fuckers, as you call them, they are, by the end of it, they are full-fledged fascists. 
Well, yeah, I think the fuckers were fascists when they came in. The the, the guards. I just I Maybe. don't agree. I don't well, agree with that. I think I think the intent intention of them is because of their age and the look of them. They look so similar to the other ones that I think they are people who were brought in in a previous group. Right. Well, then they've already become turned. fascists. Then by the start right. of the but movie, they didn't but start out that way. They didn't come in as like ready to go along with everything. I think they they adapted. And that's why they're guards is because they've gone on with the beliefs. They believe it. They're willing to do all this stuff. Hmm. Well, the way I read it was because the four guards are the ones that are going around kidnapping everybody, the, the fuckers. Uh, they spit in the girl's face. So yet yeah, your theory on them having already gone through this could, could be accurate. But the fact, I think that they're going along with it from the very beginning. Um, the, from the, the very beginning of the movie? Yeah. Yes. From the the movie, they start out that way, but I think you were to make like uh, in in inferences. In, is that the right way to say that word? Inference. Right, like they went and chose fascists, so they e- they knew that they were fascists either from previous kidnappings or whatever. But they chose people that they knew would be loyal to them, so they chose. Did you notice fledged fascists? Uh, and this is kind of a little bit of a subject change, but how large all the. Uh, uh, fascist penis were they were like uh, they were all uh cartoonishly large almost yeah um anyways. yeah i think they're obviously like fake prosthetics yeah, but yeah. i think there's something there uh anyways uh yeah i guess i, I i'm uh seeing a little bit more stuff here that i did not get on my first uh watch so well do you guys want to talk about the the guards at the end and like the very very end of the movie sure so while this torture is going on the very last thing that happens is two of the guards, they turn on the radio and a song comes on that they both like and they start dancing with each other. Well, and I, I think really important to that is the one asks the other, would you like to dance? And the, the other one is like, I don't know how to dance. So, and I guess to go along with the conformity, so he starts to show them how to dance. Uh, so go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. I think you're right that that is important. And but they start dancing, and I think the very last lines of the movie is like one of them asks, "Like, what's your girlfriend's name?" Is it the the last thing he says? And then I think he says her name. Like the one answers, and then that's the very last bit of dialogue in the movie. It's like, "What's your girlfriend's name?" And it, and like I wanted to talk about that because like initially, I laughed the first time I watched the movie, and probably even the second time at that because I thought I kind of took it as like a really silly ending. You know, like intended mm-hmm. to kind of like just be really to to accent the over the topness of of the rest of the movie and like how right. far fetched the rest of the movie was to me, and I think right. that's totally wrong. <laughs> Watching it now, how'd you take it now? I mean, I took it as the the lack of effect that anything going on around these two is having on them, right? right? That they're yeah. they're just gonna dance like normal. They're just gonna have normal conversations like kids. Uh, of like, I don't know how to dance and like having awkward teen moments and talking about their girlfriend and nonchalant, like all very nonchalant mm-hmm. while they've just experienced, uh, I guess, 120 days of people being abused, mutilated. And uh, currently while they're doing that, people are being tortured and hung and uh, mutilated outside. What'd you think of the that last scene, Mike? Yeah, I agree with Justin uh, pretty much 100%, which I think it's just, it's profoundly upsetting because it's the same two guards I think that are playing cards whenever everyone's like hanging out in the bathroom and they're all tied up in like the poop tub. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it's the same two guards that are basically just playing cards and, and like shooting the shit and, and having a grand old time. And it's like, they're totally oblivious to all the horror that is going on around them. Yeah. The way I took it was not unlike you guys, but they're the future Bishop and president they are going to go on to create the consumerism that Pasolini sees in the world. And then he makes this movie about they are at this point are adults and have created the consumerism. I think that they continue this, this tradition further. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's what's to be implied from it. Yeah. I also think it's interesting that, you know, all of the guards have guns and could like turn on these guys. Like the guards aren't, I think it goes to say what show what the guards are thinking and how they've like completely bought in because they are they were kidnapped and in a sense they are being held captive but they're so ingrained in it that like even though they have the ability to like free all of these people that are very similar to them we've commented on how like they're not much older 
mm-hmm. they could free these people if they wanted to because they have the guns. The, none of the aristocrats or the old ladies telling stories, none of them have guns or really any means to like defend themselves. Is this is this meant to represent a democracy or a, a nation where the people that are running the show don't have the weapons and any time the army could overthrow them does that make sense and is that what the the metaphor is there yeah i think that's all government like the government officials aren't aren't holding guns right well but that's what i'm saying is that that's the consumerism is what he's talking about so uh the army can't turn on won't turn on uh, or the class system where i mean it could be i don't know okay makes sense it makes sense to me yeah, I don't know if that's what he's saying or if it's if it's simply just look at what humans eventually will conform to. You can make them do anything. I was going to say, and this isn't really like an important thing, but I was going to say the one scene whenever they were walking up the stairs like on leashes at, and like made to eat like dogs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At that point in the movie, I was just relieved that there wasn't any more rape going on. <laughs> right. Like I was just like, oh, thank God, it's the dog scene. Like, and I think that's pretty bad whenever the, you're like, oh, this scene is the <laughs> the easy one to get through. Yeah, yeah where that's, she's eating nails. Yeah, this is just the part where she eats nails and yeah, her yeah, mouth this bleeds. Is just, that's it. Yeah, this is just normal, yeah, humiliation. It's it's not sitting in poop or, or making soldiers rape people or anything like that. So anyway, I just wanted to say this is the kind of movie that this is, is where you can look forward to people naked on all fours eating like dogs. Because that's yeah. one of the easier things to watch. <laughs> I I have a question before we wrap up, just for each of you. This is a pretty tough movie to watch. Does does it justify its existence? Does that make sense? Like, does no, yeah, the, it does. Does the meaning? Are you saying yes? It does justify. No, it makes it? sense. Okay. <laughs> uh, does the meaning of it justify its existence? I don't think I ever want to see this movie again. I I think I'm happy that I did watch it, or I'm not happy that I watched it. Uh, I think that there's stuff to sift through, but does the meaning justify its existence? Uh, what do you guys think? Do you think go first, Mike? Sure. Uh, yes. I'm of the opinion that anytime anyone wants to make any art about anything, its existence is justified. That being said, I agree with you that this is not necessarily a movie that I want to watch again. I've seen it a third time, and I wouldn't be upset if I never saw it again. Right. I... I don't know that it needs to be... It's a short movie, but it doesn't need to be as long as it is. I, you can get the point in a much shorter movie, I think. I think we can get rid of one of the story time sessions, and the movie would not be any less impactful. But that just comes from like fatigue of, of watching the movie for so long. I, I think it's a well-made movie, and I think it does justify its existence. I just think that... I just I, The question itself is, is something that I kind of fundamentally don't agree with. I think that I don't think artists should have to justify what they make, even yeah. if it is offensive and, and, and gross. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree with you. I mean, I guess as to my example previous to this, like the two girls in a cup, like that's not art. You know, that's shock for shock value, right? Like gross porn, isn't it? It's just nothing. Yeah, from what I, it's yeah, it's yeah. it's I, a I lot mean, of the stuff be... that happens in this movie is in two girls in a cup. Sure, but I think you would be more like accurate in, in, in comparing it to something like Human Centipede. Right. I think I would rather... Because Two Girls, One Cup's not a movie. It's just like a little online video. It's Whereas like Human Centipede is, is something that was made as a movie and, and would have to justify its own existence, kind of like what you were saying. Yeah, okay. I, s- I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think... Well, I guess if I'm going to answer my own question, then we'll let Justin... But <laughs> I would rather watch this movie than Human Centipede. Oh, uh, sure. Absolutely. Because I feel like this movie, whether I agree with the way it tells its story or the way that it, what it's showing me, or even the message, at, at least it's trying to do something better th- than just shock, which I feel like Human Centipede. And I can't speak to it because I haven't seen it, right. but it's doing something other than just shock. So, uh, or it's trying to, whether you agree whether it succeeds or not, that's another question. Right. right. What about you, Justin? Yeah, I think I'm with you, Mike. Like, it's. It's art. It's someone's message. I think it doesn't necessarily need to be justified. Like, we don't have to like it or not. Um, We just have to reckon with it. Yeah. I think the message is really important. Uh, This idea of 
being aware of what's going on around you, I guess, and not, not succumbing to the world that you live in and accepting everything for what it is. Like I, am kind of a firm believer of like question everything, Mm -hmm. you know, always ask questions. And I think that that is part of like what you would take away from this movie. So I think it's a really important message. Uh, I agree. It could be done shorter. I think part of the effect of the movie is like, the task of watching it, the slog through all this stuff, it could be shorter and you'd have to be more uncomfortable for less times, less time. But like maybe watching it that much uh, is part of the effect that it has on you. Enduring it for as long as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't think you should necessarily be let off the hook by having the movie shorter. I think uh, I can understand that it would, you could still get the message apart and that, and that it could have the same effect with it being shorter, but I don't know. Maybe that's just part of like the trial and like what you need to like take away what the movie's saying and like learn from it. Right. And, and also like there's just an important idea that goes with freedom of speech and freedom of like being able to create the art that you want to create and not being censored. And I think there is an important aspect to this movie that goes beyond like the movie itself as, as a film, but goes beyond like the reaction to it. And how it was like, it was, I think, censored or banned in the UK. It was. Until, like, I think, like, the early 2000s was when it was, like, finally able to be released in, like, its uncut original version. Yeah, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure this has been censored or banned uh, all over the place. Right. I, I, in defense of that question, I was not suggesting that we should ban any movies or that it wasn't. I was kind sure. of saying, was it worth it? Was the sure. message worth yeah. it? Yeah. Um, that was that was my intention with the question not i i do not advocate banning anything i yeah. just for the record <laughs> right yeah right well, except yeah, for it, there's this kinda... little film called camino get rid of that one <laughs> yeah that one sucks <laughs> that one sucks too but it's offensive to uh people who like good movies <laughs> right but it, but it's a it's a question that i think needs to be asked for a type of movie like this chris because look at when it came out right it was so controversial at the time that it was banned, like, almost immediately, as soon as it premiered in a lot of places. And the book itself that it was based on was banned for, like, pfft, longer, you know? Like, yeah, much, the, much longer. The Marquis de Sade himself was put in prison because he was writing these crazy things. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and there's rumors that Pasolini was murdered uh, because of this, you know? And I don't know if those are true or not, but he was murdered very shortly after this was made while he was preparing to do the French dub of the movie. So he didn't even get to see it like premiere, I don't yeah, think. Those mysterious circumstances. I read that the man that murdered him was, like in the last five years, released from prison. Mm-hmm. And he insinuated that there was other people that pushed him to do it. But the circumstances, I think, were Pasolini would go to these slums and pick up men to have sex with. And so this wasn't the first time. And so he was doing it with this... He was doing the same thing with this man, and he got murdered, uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, actually, Antonioni said that he got murdered by someone from his films, like a character from his films murdered him, which I find interesting. Yeah, the, oh, right. Uh, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, like the details and the things that happened to him were so similar to things that happen in his films. It's like he maybe created. Yeah. What killed him? Oh, I actually read. I read that they are so similar that some people have a theory that he actually committed suicide in in this way. Like he had written it and planned it all out so that he could commit suicide in such a way. So there's some pretty far fetched (laughs) theories on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very interesting. Like the whole, like the, just the historical context of the movie is like, you almost don't have to watch the movie. Just read up on it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, And it's insanely interesting. Yeah, it's a fascinating tale from beginning to end. The story of this movie, the the idea where it came from, all the way to its release. That might be an interesting movie to watch. One about the making of this movie. Yeah, like yeah. The Disaster Artist, but for Salo. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would watch that in an instant. Starring, uh, what's the guy's name from The Room? James Franco? No, from The Room. Oh, Tommy Wiseau? Tommy Wiseau? Yeah. Starring Tommy Wiseau. I, that didn't sound right. Star- starring Tommy Wiseau. All right, so any last thoughts on Solo, anybody? Uh, no, I, I, I'm no, good. I so. If I don't have to think about it for a while, I'm good. Yeah, like right. I said, I, 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 would, I wouldn't be upset if I never had to watch this movie again. Right. Yeah, same. I think three times in one lifetime is enough. 
Yeah, to be honest, I was really angry after the movie. I was like, this is a piece of shit. And it, I went through this for no reason. And then I read a little bit more into it and found out that there is more to it, but I that anger is not completely gone or that maybe that You're just, still coming to terms with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it I think that's... it'll sit better over time. Like you'll it'll grow with yeah. you, I think. You heard us say like we this is our third time seeing it each and I think we're probably at least I don't want to speak for Justin, but I'm just now taking more away from it. Yeah, I guess I just don't feel like I I need to take any more from it. <laughs> I'm sure there yeah, is, it, but yeah. Anyways, so uh, I guess that's it for the solo review. Yeah, so let's let's move on into our end of the episode question. And this week we wanted to ask, what is the most disturbing movie that we've seen? And we did tweet this out, and we got a few responses uh, from some listeners. So from at Charles Killick says that his most disturbing movie that he's ever seen was The Orphanage. He actually saw it in English class, apparently. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like tra- a cool English class. Right. That movie's in Spanish. What is that doing in English yeah, class? Yeah, I think that was actually, uh, um, he was like, it wasn't even Spanish class. But you've got a lot of uh, disturbing movies ahead of you, Charles Killick, if you think The Orphanage is disturbing. That's a great movie, though. Yeah, it is yeah. a great movie, but it's nowhere near the level of No, but solid. it is a little disturbing. Uh, without giving anything away, the end is disturbing, but in a different way. Right, than right. I think what we intended when we asked that question. Yeah, yeah. and that, that, that's a we, good point. We had Mike. Sallow in mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think the movie is very effective in all sorts of ways. So the ending is very impactful. It's unsettling and, is right, what yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Kind of like, uh, what's that mo- oh, oh, it's a really great Criterion movie. And they remade it for Mer- with Keeper Sutherland. The, the Vanishing. Vanishing. Oh, yes. yeah. That is, a that, is really... a, that is a disturbing movie. And an unsettling movie in like a great way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Charles Killick, if you're listening to this, uh, and you like the orphanage, give the vanishing a shot. Absolutely, that's a great movie. All right, so next we have also from Twitter at Projected Film sent in three different movies, uh, which they considered disturbing movies. I've only seen one of them. They are a Serbian film from 2010, Dogtooth from 2009 and taxidermia from 2006 have any of you guys seen any of these movies i haven't seen a one of them i haven't either they don't sound like yeah well i haven't seen dogtooth or taxidermia i want to see dogtooth i hear it's great but a serbian film i have seen i actually saw it the same way i saw Salo, which was uh long before you know like film struck in hulu i had to download serbian film because there was just no good releases for it in America. And uh, there were like lots of different versions around because it was so heavily edited, because it's so chocked full of crazy content. <laughs> that uh, Anyway. Yeah, it's I've heard all movie. about what's yeah. in a Serbian film. Yeah. Like, I've, it's crazy. I've had it's... the plot and details explained to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it deserves to be on this list. It's a, <laughs> it's a pretty messed up movie. Yeah. I don't right. think it's very good, but it's, it's disturbing. Fair enough. Do you guys want to move into our answers? Yeah. All right, Chris, what is your most disturbing movie you've seen? So the most disturbing movie I've ever seen, I, I, I read a review in the paper. This is back in 2002 is when it came out. But I read a review. It got five stars. I, I read the – Christopher Kelly was the uh, reviewer. And so I wanted to go see this movie. It was rated five stars. And he the other movies, like he had rated Memento five stars. And so I was like, oh, great. I'm going to watch another great movie because I love Memento. And Justin's wrong if he thinks that it's bad. (laughs) But, so another movie that's similar to Memento in style, but not in content, is Irreversible. I went and saw this movie in the theater. And I have, I went by myself at that too. So I went by myself to the theater to watch Irreversible. I'm sitting in the theater. It makes you seasick at the beginning, at the beginning anyways. I have never seen so many people walk out of a movie theater ever. I stuck around the whole time, but, uh, you know, it's really disturbing. But you hated yourself by the end of it, right? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, The thing that I think I like about Irreversible, it's like watching a nightmare, very similar to Solo, right? It's like watching a nightmare, your nightmares come to life. But a lot of times in movies, violence is stylized or looks cool, but at the very beginning of this movie, they take a 
a fire hydrant and just smash this guy's face in. And there's no cutaway, right? And in most movies, or if you're watching Die Hard or whatever, he'd hit the guy with the fire hydrant and it would cut away. But the thing I, I liked, even though it was like watching a nightmare, is that it shows you the violence that happens in film that oftentimes gets cut away. So have yeah. you guys seen this movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. It's got some crazy opening credits, too. Right. Yeah. I've seen the I've seen it about three or four times actually. Oh, I think it's actually amazing. Like I would give it five stars too. Yeah, yeah that's Gaspar No, right? Yeah. Yep. Have you guys seen uh, Enter the Void? I have. I have. I not. watched it with you. Yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah. I, I knew you had seen it. I was mainly asking Chris. <laughs> I mainly don't. I think I'd be okay if I never watch another Gaspar Noé movie. I, I never want to see sense. Irreversible I get that again. Sentiment. Um, I, I can respect it for what it is, but it's not pleasant. And it's not that's it's just not what I'm looking for when I go to see a movie. I, I, I like to be challenged, but not in this way. Does that make sense? No, totally. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a hard film to watch it, but like I the craft that it's made with and the, the way that it makes you ill with like the camera movement and the the audio, it's crafted so well that like all of it adds to the story. Like they're not they're not spinning the camera around and making you sick, like just to make you sick. Like that also fits with what's going on because the, the film starts much like memento at the end of the story. And we go backwards in time to see where it happens. But like, you don't know what's going on Mm -hmm. when that, when that first and second scene happens. So like the camera's panning around, it disorients you just like you're disoriented uh, as a viewer of like what's going on with the story. You have no idea why anybody's doing what they're doing. And it, it all serves like the story of everything that's happening in it. And I, I think it's like a kind of a masterpiece. Yeah. I would not disagree with you. There's a quote. Somebody told Michael Hineke that they couldn't finish his movie funny games. And he's like, well, you don't have to watch it. The movie's not for you. And that's kind of how I feel like these movies aren't necessarily for me. So fair enough. All right, Mike, do you want to go next? Sure. I was going to do human centipede part two. But I thought that would be kind of a lame one. So at the last minute, I remembered a better movie. Uh, and it's called Clean Shaven from 1993. Oof. And it's yep. directed by Lodge Kerrigan. And it's about a man, according to IMDb, it's about a man suffering from schizophrenia. He's released from a mental institution, and he attempts to get his daughter back from her adoptive family. And, oh, man. I don't want to go too much into detail about, like, why this movie is disturbing. But there are sequences that I just, I could not wait for them to be over when I was watching this. And, oh, man, it's, it's to me, it's so much worse than, than Sallow, like the stuff that happens in Clean Shaven. And, but the subject matter is, is not even remotely the same. So I'll keep it vague, but there's just some, there's some crazy mutilation of self-mutilation in that movie that just yeah. brutal, brutal. Yeah, I've seen the film, and I guess the way that I remember feeling about that film, pretty much a majority of the way through it, was the way that I felt, to to use an example that probably more people have seen, would be the part in Black Swan where Natalie Portman starts pulling on her hangnail. Yeah, yeah. Right? (laughs) That feeling, but even more so and more often for Clean Shaven. I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember watching a lot of it like with like my shoulders scrunched up and like kind of through my fingers at times to like yeah. I don't know if I want to see what's going to happen. Yeah, and yeah. for those that are interested in watching it just stick around because it's uh, spine number 354 so we will get to it in probably about 4 years. Oh, thank God, it's a ways away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to watching that one again even more so than Solo. Yeah, that's probably the one I'm looking forward to watching the least. <laughs> yeah. W- uh, what about you Justin? What is your most disturbing movie that you have seen? Okay, I'm going to go with one that maybe is a, a little bit different and it is it's disturbing at certain points and while as a whole on a whole like the movie didn't disturb me completely or disturb me in the way that same way that like solo or reversible or human centipede would the end of the movie like just stuck with me for like days and that movie is mysterious skin Ooh. uh by fuck i had his name while i was thinking greg about iraqi it. yep greg iraqi by Greg Araki, was the director. It was based on a book, and I've read both like the book and the movie. Like it, it's 
one of those that I just couldn't stop thinking about after I saw it because the ending is so impactful and powerful and and twisted and it's nothing that like you're seeing twisted things going on it's just people talking about things right like much like mm-hmm. the, I guess like the stories in Solo it's like hearing people talk about things and telling these stories is sometimes worse than actually seeing them mm-hmm. so it, I mean it like I couldn't stop thinking about it. I went and found the book and read the book in like a day and a half, which is a record for me as far as as books. I'm a slow reader. (laughs) (laughs) And then I immediately watched the film again. I've watched it probably three or four times since. And just, it's a story about two uh, like high school, graduating high school, going into college age kids. One of them is uh, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He is a gay prostitute. And the other is played by Brady Corbet, who was in Funny Games, mm-hmm. Michael Haneke's Funny Games. The and American version. Yes. Good point. <laughs> um, and he plays a, a guy who has this, like, flash of his life where he can't remember. Like, it's just a black space, and he doesn't know what happened to him. He gets convinced that he is abducted by aliens, and they share a baseball team <laughs> uh, pass together. They were on the same baseball team. And basically things start to unfold from there. And what you find out, like what actually happened to them as kids is, is super disturbing. And I won't say any more than that, I guess. Yeah. One remembers it perfectly and the other one doesn't remember it at all. And uh, anyway, it's very affecting movie. Yeah. I think much like the, the orphanage, like everything builds up to like one point that when it finally happens, it's just like, it, it's so disturbing and you're so attached to like the characters and you know, everybody and to like, think about. These it's more of a happening. sadness than it is a disturbing feeling. Right. At least with me in that movie. <laughs> it is, but I think the sadness is born out of being disturbed. For <laughs> sure. Like at least for me, I agree. Sad stuff. Yep. <laughs> I'm ready right. for this podcast to be over. Yeah, me too. I'm sad. <laughs> okay, so sad that it's over. Yeah, hmm. sad that we can't talk about disturbingly sad movies anymore. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank you for listening. I know it's probably a bit of a chore. If you made it through this whole thing, congratulations! Like, uh, you've earned my respect. This has yeah. been the most uplifting podcast. Yeah. Go listen to Tomb Raider. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should should be a lot more easy going. Sure. And then, of course, thank you, Jake Wagner Russell, for creating our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. And we recently had our Oscar bet for the Academy Awards, where we had listeners send in their Oscar picks, and the winner got to choose a movie for us to review. Next week, we will be going over the winner's pick, and that is from Corbin Hubbard, and he told us to watch Barbarian Sound Studio from 2012. So be on the lookout for that. Hopefully it's not as disturbing as Solo. I need something light. And if you want to follow along with what we're watching next, let us know what you think about Solo. Ask us questions about Barbarian Sound Studio, you know, the topics you want us to talk about with that. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinemedia. If you want to talk film in general, you can join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Casual Cinemedia. And if you want to email us directly, you can do so at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And don't forget to go ahead and enter into that iTunes review contest. Uh, we only have a little bit of time left, so go ahead and enter in. Send in those five-star reviews yep. with words in them, not just five-star ratings on iTunes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, until next time, guys, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. See you later. Thank you.